Okay, hello everybody. My name is Mikhail Luhian. I am a developer at Tarrant. And at Tarrant, I have two main responsibilities. One of them is I am a machine learning and computer vision engineer. And the second one is I am an augmented reality and uh, Unity developer. So in the past 10 years, I also have had quite extensive experience in animation and cinema. So I did quite a lot of things. I did animation, animation direction, design, compositing. Whatever field you can find in animation, I probably did it. And the, uh, today I would like to talk to you about generative art. And uh, the main reason that I would like to talk to you about generative art is that for the first time in this artistic, um, for the first time in its history, generative art is finally making money. So this is, uh, and by making money, I don't mean like just a couple of artists selling their artwork. I mean like serious commercial projects that can develop, um, have a, um, that have a stable profit. Uh, what is very interesting is that this movement has been uh, enabled by two very, uh, by two extremely hype technologies. So one of them is blockchain and the other one is AI. And I really find interesting how these two uh, technologies have intermingled with generative art. And so I, I hope that through this talk you will understand why this is pretty exciting and, and very interesting. Um, what I would also would like to, to speak about is how all of this intermingling um, works with copyright. So in general, generative art as a movement is very uncopyrightable. It is extremely hard to define some copyright rules for generative art. And then when you mix this thing with blockchain and, and AI, it gets even more complicated. Um, so I would like to, to speak about this in the, in, in the last part of the talk. Uh, in general, the layout will go like this. I, uh, first of all, I'll give you a working definition of, of what generative art means. Uh, in the second part, I'll, I'll, I'll show a couple of projects that have been making money and have been uh, generating interest. And then, in, in the last part, I'll speak about copyright issues and how all of this creates a couple of problems. And I'll also do a small art demo for you. Like, it's, it's a really basic demo that, that that would probably make all of my points a bit more clearer to understand and things like this. Okay, so then let me explain to you what generative art is. I think Wikipedia has one of the best definitions on generative art, and basically the, 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 fun the fundamental definition of this art movement is that instead of having an artist um, creating a piece of work, you have an independent system that uh, that is um, by its design non-human and that independently determines the features of the artwork. Uh, I'll show you a couple of examples in my next slides. But generally the way people think about it nowadays is that you have an algorithm that generates some piece of art. So you've probably seen it in movies, in, in maybe in, uh, in modern galleries, where um, you have you have a computer that generates an image, but that's not necessary. You can have also... Um, a robot that generates an image, or you can have a chemistry project that generates some kind of a visual or auditory experience, and all of this falls under the umbrella of generative art. Um, generally, if you start searching online for this term, you would usually find two frameworks. One of them is processing, and the other one is called open frameworks. And these are kind of like the projects that made generative art popular. Uh, until the, the, 2000, the year 2000, nobody actually really knew about this art movement. And then once um, processing became really popular, you have, you have a lot of students uh, learning processing in their bachelor or master, uh, master programs. And so this kind of um, resulted in generative art being more popular. But, but even though it became popular, it still didn't really generate money. Like it, it, took quite a lot of time until people found ways to monetize this art movement. Um, and, and this is what we'll speak about later. Okay, so here's a couple of examples. So all of this thing doesn't sound as abstract. These three guys, Manolo, Tyler Hobbs, and John Maeda, are kind of like the, the most representative artists at this moment, especially um, this guy. He was named by, by quite a few. He was named um, as the genius boy of generative art. And you can already see kind of like 
more or less the features of what makes this art movement different from other art movements. Like one example is the fact that you have a lot of detail in your images. Um, the other one is a kind of a very aesthetic that gears more towards design than painting. And this was also pretty prevalent in the beginnings of the movement. So th these are one of the first uh, generative art, pro um, one of the first um, images uh, done like done. Ah, sorry. Okay. Um, this was. This is one of the. F the oh, come on. I got. <laughs> sorry. This was done by the the, the pioneers of the art movement. Um, these two were German. And this was, and this is a French lady, and you can you can see that in the, uh, already in the beginning this was more of a design art movement rather than a painterly uh, movement. Okay, so now that you've seen these images, you realize that randomness is kind of like a key component of generative art, and what it, what is very important for me to explain to you is that if you're using a computer to, gener to generate art, and that, and that algorithm requires randomness, then you'll have to use a very specific algorithm to generate randomness. And that, those algorithms generally are called pseudo-random number generators. And these generators have a couple of very key, um, a ver a couple of very, uh, key characteristics. So first of all, they're completely deterministic. They're not, they don't, don't have any actual randomness in them. In them. What they do have, is what they, what they generally do is that they generate a deterministic row of numbers. And this row of numbers has certain statistical properties that emulate actual random strings. But, they, but generally, it, it depends on the algorithm. So some algorithms will emulate certain characteristics of random numbers. Um, and the way the deterministic part is implemented is that these algorithms have a so-called internal state. And basically, um, this internal state determines the output of the algorithm. Um, so, so if you imagine that I am ru running the same algorithm on two or three computers, and all of them have the same internal, internal start state, then all of them will generate the same string of numbers. Um, and this is actually really important not only for art, this, in, this is uh, in general a key component of a lot of crypto cryptographic algorithms, um, and generative art kind of sit, sits on top of them. Okay, so then here's the, the interesting part, because generative art uses randomness in its, in its process, in its generation process, then this means that um, that w when you're creating a piece of art, you're not creating one image, you're actually creating a distribution of images. And then depending on the internal state of your random, random number generator, you'll get a different image. And what this means is that uh, a generative art project is more like a distribution. It, it doesn't behave like just one image. It is a group of images, and all of those images together specify your project. So if you, if you would look at these images right here, like let's say this one is a really nice example. Um, I can run those algorithms with different random numbers, and each time the image will look a bit different. Each time um, the squares will have a different rotation, or the, the falloff will start at a different level. But all of those images together will, will, will constitute your, your generative art project. So the system is sometimes more interesting than the image itself. And this is kind of like one of the key points of generative art. You don't, um, you don't think only about the image, you're also trying to understand the system from which the, the, the image came. Um, here's a different example. Like imagine those flowers there could, could have been drawn in a different order, and the image would have looked differently, but to you as, as the guy who looks at the image, you'll understand that both of them come from the same world. They're, they're related, they're different and yet somehow very closely related. Okay, so then um, l I'll show you a couple of commercial projects, and then maybe though these ideas will be more clear to you. Uh, more specifically, I would like to start with a project called CryptoKitties, and then and then these images um, 
explained very well this idea of a distribution. So basically, in CryptoKitties, you have a distribution, a population of kitties. And all of those kitties look differently. So you can see that you have uh, some pretty standard kitties, you, you have some pretty special kitties, but all of them are... Um, you can clearly see that they come from the same place and from the same artist and things like, things like that. And so how does CryptoKitties work? Well, first of all, CryptoKitties is a blockchain um, application, which means that in some way or another, the, these kitties live on the blockchain. The way they implemented this is that the image itself is not on the blockchain. Rather, what is on the blockchain is the genome of the kitty. And the genome of the kitty is a 256-bit number that specifies how the kitty will look like. This is a very nice example. So you can see here, this is one kitty, and this is the kitty's genome, basically. And the, the reason you don't see numbers, the reason, um, the reason you see names instead of, rumber, uh, instead of numbers, is that the users of the CryptoKitty website figure out um, how each number maps to certain features. So like they already know that uh, Siberian will generate a certain kind of a kitty with a certain kind of a color and things like that. So already you can see that the community is pretty invested in, the, in this project and they really liked it. And somebody actually had to spend quite a lot of money to figure out how the genome maps to the images. Um, what is... Uh, sorry? Um, so just like to, to give you an example, like imagine the, the first bit of this 256 number is, is one then this bit uh, can specify if the kitty has, um, has a flat color background or the background has some detail in it, for example. The second bit can specify if the kitty has... Um, I don't know, if, if the kitty has stripes or doesn't have stripes. The third bit and the fourth bit together can decide what's the color of the background and things like that. So this is one way um, you can map a, geno to, a genome to an image. Now, what makes this project interesting is that you can breed the kitties. So imagine they're on the blockchain. You own one kitty. Somebody, a different user owns a different kitty. And then you can breed them on the blockchain uh, and, and create a new kitty. And when they, they breed, the, there is a special genetic algorithm that mixes their genomes. So the, the new kitty will inherit some features from the parents. Some t uh, the, uh, the kitties will inherit some features from one parent, some features from another parent, and plus a bit of, bit of randomness just to make the thing a bit more interesting. And so th this is how you can, you can basically um, make the population bigger. And if I were to make a connection between what I said about distribution of images and genomes, basically the genome is the random seed of the pseudo-random number generator that draws the, these kitties. So, um, I, I would like to make this idea more clear. So, if, if I know the genome of one kitty, then technically speaking, the algorithm that generates these images will always generate the same image for the same genome. And this is exactly how you would do generative art on a computer. For each internal state of your pseudo-random number generator, you'll always get the same image. And this is how one would make the parallel between... Uh, and this is how I would make the argument on why CryptoKitties is a generative art project. Because it has the same properties. It, 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 it generates a distribution in the same way that a generative art would, would generate a distribution. Now, um, CryptoKitties has been really famous. So, even though most of you probably didn't heard about it, it's one of the few projects in, in, in blockchain that actually generate a lot of profit. So they, uh, until now, they have something like 30 million, they generated something like 30, 30 million dollars. And this is not trivial, for, especially for a blockchain, um, for a blockchain startup. Um, and what they also did is that they started a kind of, somebody would call it a new generation of gaming. So there's been a lot of projects that have tried to emulate CryptoKitty's success, and most of them have kind of the same features. All of them need, um, all of them have a, a gathering component, a breeding component, a collection component, and some way that these things interact with one another. Um, what is even more important for my talk is that uh, CryptoKitties has spawned a new standard called the non-fungible token standard. Um, this is 
um, here's the best way to think about this thing. Because it, it, it's, it's kind of unintuitive when you start thinking about it. So a, a fungible token is how we think about money. If I have one euro, and I, I would like to change one euro for a different euro, there's absolutely no difference between those euros. I can go to a shop and buy the same kind of beer for the same euro, and nobody cares which euro I have in my pocket. What is also important is that the euro can be divided in 50 cents, in 20 cents, there is no difference. I can, like, basically, I can do whatever I want with this sum of money. Non-fungible tokens are exactly the opposite. They're basically unique things that are not interchangeable and are not divisible. Um, the simplest way to think about it is like if you own a Picasso. That Picasso is unique, and if I have one Picasso, I wouldn't necessarily want to change it for a different Picasso. Or if I have, I don't know, a Van Gogh, it, it doesn't have the same value as, um, as a Rembrandt or, or some other painting. So all of, all of the paintings are unique, and um, changing between one, one to another is kind of complicated. There is no simple way to do it. Okay, so now um, I'll speak a bit about AI projects. You've probably read in the news that there have been people selling AI art for quite large sums of money. So this, is kind of, this has happened a couple of month, months ago at Sotheby's. Um, this also happened, um, like you have an AI robot that, that, that is generating art and, and it, it already sold... Um, assets for more than $1 million, and things like that. So how does this work? Um, before even talking about AI art, I, would, I need to specify what I mean by AI. Because a lot, of people in, uh, a lot of people understand AI in different ways, depending on who you're talking about. And in this particular case, AI ha has a very specific meaning. So, Generally, when people talk about AI, they refer to neural nets. And this is, this is kind of unfortunate because AI isn't only about neural nets. AI is a, lot more, is, a, is a more complicated movement than neural nets. And uh, what's even more annoying is that when people speak about AI in art movements, they always refer to just one specific AI algorithm, which is called the, um, the Generative Adversarial Networks Architecture. And there are a couple of reasons why people confound all of these together, like guns with image generation and with AI. One of them being that this architecture has been really, uh, really popular in the research community. It is extremely easy to use. You can always download a, a train neural network from GitHub. You, you can run it in five seconds, as in, you can run it in five seconds, and it just works. But it's it is just one small piece of AI. It is, not, it, it is not the whole movement. And basically, when people are talking about AI in art, they're only, they're only speaking about this algorithm. And it, it is important for me personally, it is important for me, it is important for me so that you understand that technically speaking, the AI art movement still hasn't happened. Like, th there is still so much stuff that needs to be tried and, and discovered. Um, okay, so how, how do these networks work? The, the basic idea behind GANs is that you will feed them a data set, um, usually a quite big data set, and these algorithms will try to emulate that data set. So if I, if I feed it, uh, I don't know, 10 million images of cats, then it will try to generate cats. Or if I feed it millions of human faces, it will generate human faces. And you can see how good these algorithms have become, because these are all generated faces. They're not real humans. Now, how is this, what's the relation between generative art and neural networks? And in this particular case, the, the connection is very clear, because each one of these generated images was uh, generated using an input to the neural net. And each time you feed the, ne the network the same input, it will, it, will give you the same, it will give you the same image. So basically, this, is, this works kind of like the genome of the CryptoKitties. It's only that in the CryptoKitties um, algorithm, th there was a very clear mapping between the genome and the final output. In the GANs, everything is a lot more confusing. Actually, nobody even knows how the input gets mapped to the final image. But at least you have this 
this very specific rule that if you give it the same input, you will always get the same output. Okay, so um, in case you wanted to see um, this, this thing in, in more detail, here's how it looks like. And now, here's what makes GANs special uh, when, when speaking about generative art. So, uh, until now, most of, uh, most of the art generating code was written by hand. So if you think back about, uh, if you think back at the squares or at the flowers that I showed, I showed you a couple of minutes ago, all of those were basically hand coded in one way or another. Guns are different in that they, you feed them information, you feed them a lot of images, and then you don't really know what the thing will spit out. You're never exactly sure if I feed it this input, what will be the output. And the, the more diverse the data set, the more diverse their output. And to some, in some sense, their uh, guns are the most complicated generative art project that has ever existed. Because I can feed it millions and millions of images, and then this neural network will generate absolutely everything. It will generate cats, buildings, cities, uh, dogs, food, whatever you want, and all in, in, in one neural network. Um, so this is why they're, they're, kind of, they're kind of generative art on steroids. You, <laughs> you, it, is, it is pretty easy to forget how powerful and how, um, uh, how unusual they are. And to be honest, even the researchers who train these neural networks often have no idea what these networks can do. Because it's, it is absolutely impossible to, to look at the whole space. Um, for example, the, if, I, if I would go back to these faces, the input for each one of these faces was probably a, a ten, uh, an array of 10,000 numbers, probably sometimes even more. And so, it is, you can imagine it is absolutely impossible to check all the possible configurations and to understand, okay, this point in space, this point, this point in space generally gives me a woman. This point in space and, and everything around it will generally give a man. This point in space is responsible for the glasses and things like that. It is, it is an, uh, an, an ongoing area of research. It is an ongoing area of research to at least understand how the, the input gets mapped to the output. But I can guarantee you that no researcher has any idea how this thing works. Um, wh what is also really important to, to explain about guns is that the data set is um, the data set is key in more than one way. So the architecture is really important, but the data set itself is also very important because if the data set has a certain look, let's say you have a data set that where all the photos were taken by a professional uh, photographer with a professional lens, then all of the photos in the, in the data set, will, uh, then all the, um, the photos generated by the algorithm will have the same look. And so if you have two people who train different architectures on the same data set, the output from those guns will, be, will look the same. And so if you show them to, um, if, if I show you two pictures from these, from, um, okay, sorry. So if I have two people, each one with his own net, everybody under, uh, both generate an image, and then I show, to, show them to you side by side, you might not be able to tell me, okay, this comes from this algorithm and this comes from, from a different algorithm. And so if you're planning on using guns in creative, uh, for creative purposes, it might be hard to prove that what you're doing is different from what other people are doing. And this is like just, scra just, um, just scratching the surface of how guns um, uh, how guns break copyright, but I'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to it in, in a couple of minutes. Okay, so now, um, why, why am I mentioning copyright at all in, this, um, in these two cases? So here's the... Um, uh, sorry? Okay, so here's the problem. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but when you buy a painting, like let's say you buy a Picasso, you actually have two rights associated to the painting. One of it is called the property rights, and the other one is called the copyright rights. So if I own, if I buy a Picasso, if it's not explicitly stated in the buying contract, then this means that I'm only buying the property rights, which means that I can, I can do whatever I want with the painting, 
but I'm not allowed, for example, to show it in a movie. Or I'm not allowed to make a photograph of it and then sell the photograph of it. This is a different set of rights. Um, and if, if I were to, to, to give an extreme example, if I own a Picasso, I have the right to burn it. I have the right to cut it, I have the right to paint over it, but I'm not allowed to sell photographs of it. Um, and what is unusual about CryptoKitties is that CryptoKitties does all of this exactly in the opposite direction. So, in the case of the CryptoKitties, you can do whatever you want with the images. So, if I own a CryptoKitty, then I can show that image of the CryptoKitty to absolutely everybody. I can print it on cardboard and sell it to whomever, who, to whomever I want. But I'm not allowed to modify the image, which is really unusual. So, basically, if I have a Picasso, I can paint over the Picasso and nobody cares. Well, theoretically, nobody cares. But if I have a CryptoKitty, I am not allowed to draw over it, because then I'm, I'm violating the license under which I am buying this kitty. So l let me just um, show you exactly the, the thing that I'm talking about. So it, it is this part here. Okay, this is better. So the developer grants me a non-exclusive, non-transferable license to use, copy, and display the art of the purchased kitty. But uh, I may not or attempt to do any of the following things, like, for example, modify the art for your purchase kitty. Uh, it's this part here. So now, like, just imagine a very simple use case. I am buying a Picasso. I am buying 100 Picassos. And then I'm putting those Picassos in a restaurant. Nobody has absolutely no problem with me. I can put those Picassos in a restaurant. I can, uh, I can uh, invite people in my restaurant. I can make money with, with this, no problem. If I own a bunch of crypto kitties, I can also put them in a restaurant. But as soon as I, I somehow change their look, like for example, I don't know, I want to put all those kitties on a certain background, or I want to give a frame to all of those kitties, and technically speaking, I am not allowed to do this. So, which is really strange. What's, what is even stranger is that if, if, let's say, tomorrow the company goes bankrupt and all of those images, um, if the company goes background, I will still own the genome of the kitty on the blockchain, but the images themselves can disappear and I would have no, no access to them. So they can basically delete all of their servers and, and, and I'm losing access to the thing that I thought I'm originally buying. Um, so basically, you have to be really careful about this. Ownership in this case means something completely different, uh, and you should be and you should actually read the terms of service to know that you're buying what you think you're buying. So, th so this is one example. Okay. So now, what's the problem with the whole AI art thing? Um, in general, if I if I would have to speak about copyright and neural nets, this is a this is a nightmare. Uh, this is in general a nightmare. The, the problem of copyright in neural nets is such a big issue, and at some point somebody will have to, have to seriously think about it, because there's all sorts of, sorts of rights associated to neural nets, especially when you train neural nets and things like that. But what I would like to, to focus on in this, um, in this part is open source. And, and the reason is, as fo is the following. So, um, AI research in general is a pretty open source friendly community. So most of, most, of the, most of the neural nets that you will find online will be licensed under an MIT license, which basically means you can do whatever you want to these, um, to these networks. You can use them in your commercial proje projects, you can sell them, you can do whatever you want. Um, just an example, I, I added the MIT license here, and you can see very clearly that you can, you have the right to use, copy, modify, merge, publish, do whatever you want with code that is licensed under an MIT license. Now, personally, I would argue that this license doesn't cover all actual use cases. So let me give you an example. Let's say somebody trains a neural net, puts it online, I download it, use it to generate some images, and then I sell the images. Under this license, this is absolutely no problem. It, it grants me the, the right to do whatever I want with these images. But the problem is that this license doesn't give me the copyright to the generated images. 
So technically speaking, I can do whatever I want with these images, but I do not own the copyright. And what is even more insidious is that this license doesn't cover the rights of the guy who, who gave me the data set, for example. Um, okay, so l let me make this a bit more clearly. Imagine I have a data set. Somebody publishes this data set. This is the first guy. The second guy uses the data set, trains a neural network. Then I come in, I use the neural net, and generate the art. Okay? So then it's three people in this chain. The MIT license doesn't say anything about the copyright rights of each of these guys. It doesn't, it doesn't tell me if the guy who supplied the data set has any, has any copyright... Um, if the, if the guy who supplied the data set... No, sorry. Um, I, I, I probably need to, to say this in a different way. So, um, the, the, the reason I'm mentioning all of these problems is that in the music industry, you have a very, a very clear model. In the music industry, everybody who um, added, everybody who did something to a piece of music owns copyright. The guy who wrote the lyrics owns the copyright to the lyrics. The guy who, uh, who wrote the music owns the right to the music. The, the guy who did the, the final mix owns the, right, owns the rights to the mix. Um, and this is more or less what's happening in this case. Everybody who did at least something that helped to train the final neural network arguably has rights associated with the final, with the final result. And then this, li this license here doesn't say anything about it. And so if I want to use open source software in my art project, I really need to think about this case. Uh, I really need to think about these things. Because then what can happen is that I, can st I start selling these images. These images become very popular. I'm making a lot of money. And then I get a lawsuit that's saying, hey, this actually violates copyright. Uh, this actually violates the copyright rights of the guy who trained the neural network. Or the, this, this violates the right of the guy who compiled the data set. Because under European law, a data set can also be copyrighted. Uh, and so this creates a bunch of problems that licenses do not, um, that aren't handled by the licenses and can create problems if you want to use them in actual projects. And, and if you think I'm just inventing these issues, this is not actually what happened. So like, for example, uh, this image here was already uh, kind of created problems uh, of the same nature because the, the people who, um, who generated this image used code written by some other guy. And so then, once that guy saw that this image sold for $400,000, he said, OK, but why don't I have a piece of the cake? Because I also somehow contributed uh, to this piece of work. Uh, just a second. Um, OK, so then this is what I wanted to, to tell you about uh, generative art. And to make the things a bit more clear, I'll, I'll show you a, um, a small example of how one would, would do generative art. It, is not, it, it, it won't be fancy, but it, I, I think it will drive, it will show you kind of the problems that, that this will create for copyright. Okay, so um, who knows what is the Bernoulli distribution? Okay, uh, the Bernoulli distribution is something very easy. It is basically true or false with a certain probability. Um, in the first image, let's say the probability is 10%, in the second image it's 30%, and in the last image it's uh, 80%. And the Bernoulli distribution is the e easiest and most boring distribution that you can ever think about. Now, um, generally, when somebody will start doing some generative art, he will try to understand how, did, how does this distribution work, what, what, is, um, what kind of visual properties that it does it have. And so, for example, in this case, I just wanted, I was curious on what happens when I have two of these distributions, one beside the other. Now, here's what interesting things you can do with it. Um, oh, okay. So here's one interesting thing, thing you could do with it. For example, you can have a gradient, or you can have a circle, or you can have a different kind of a circle. And all of them use the same Gaussian distribution. And now, using these, um, these fundamental elements, you can make something even more complex, like these guys here, which basically um, look like 
Um, if you've ever used the Spray and Paint tool in Microsoft Paint, this is what it looks like. And now the question is, okay, you've showed us this, why is this in any way valuable? Like, what do I get out of this? Um, and what is important for, for you to understand is that in this case, this is code. Né? So this is, I would say, 30 lines of code that allowed me to do this. And because I have the code in my, uh, because I have the code in front of me, I can change it. And each time I change it, I will get a different result. So like, for example, the difference between these images and these images is just one line of code. I just basically changed three or four parameters in the code and got a completely different visual result. And now imagine I have two artists. One of, the, one of them publishes his code online. The other one copies the code, does a couple of modifications. It looks different. OK, wonderful, I can sell it. And then uh, each one of you would have to decide by himself if he considers this a creative act or not. Like, is this actual creativity when you're just modifying a couple of parameters in code or not? So like, for example, this is a different, this is a different set of images, and all of them are exactly one, li one line of code, a, a distance of line, one line of code from these guys here. And generative art in general has this problem. Like, um, if you think about it, if we go back to the, to the neural network, to the neural net stuff. If I have one neural network, somebody makes a copy of it, modifies just one line of code in the architecture, trains it, then am I allowed to have copyright? Does, is he allowed to have copyright rights on this new ne neural network or not? Is he, does this change of, uh, change of code, no, sorry, is this change of code considered a creative act or not? Is this a creative decision or is this, or is this just some mechanical changing of letters? And then that's it. Okay, and so this is, um, I guess this is the end. This is what I wanted to, to show you. I, I hope that, you, that at least I've, I've been able to implement an interesting idea in your brain in this evening. Um, and maybe you can think about it while, work, while going home, like, okay, how, what is your attitude and generative art, like what do you think about it? Um, if if you have something that is 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 done in code and not in in manual labor, is this still considered creative? So th does does generative art in general have a place in our society? Um, do we are we interested in systems or are we interested j just in these images? Like th these are topics that would be int really interesting to to think about because basically they might decide how the future of art looks like. Where, um, just imagine in the future, instead of having just one image that is static for uh, thousands of years, you might have a screen, and then that screen would generate a new image each five minutes, or I don't know, each one minute. And then this would be a different way for us to experience art in general. But is this like, are we ready for this? Is this something that we would consider art? Or is this just user experience? Or like how, what kind of attitude should we have towards these kind of artifacts? Like these are kind of the things that I would really like for you to think about uh, on your way home. Um, okay, thank you, for the, thank you for your attention. I am done. Um, thank you very much. Very confusing, <laughs> but enlightening as well. Um, in order to have an art market, you told mm -hmm. about sales. Somebody has to decide that this is art and mm -hmm. it has a value, whatever that is. So exactly. I'm won wondering who decided about those results that this is art. You mean uh, about these guys here? For example, yeah, this was sold for I don't know what, yeah, mm -hmm. a type of money. Um, who is the one who says, yes, this is art, and the other one who accepts that it's art and pays for it? Now, what he or she bought, I'm still not sure what has been bought, but at the end, you look at the result, mm -hmm. and this is, makes you want it. I don't mm -hmm. think it's a code which makes you want it, or mm -hmm. am I wrong? Um, okay. Here's how I would... Here's, here's how I personally think about this kind of situation. So first of all, I, I would like to make a difference between art and business in the first case. 
So the fact that you get money for your art doesn't mean that doesn't make your art more valuable. So these are two different things. Basically, one is just a validation of the other. We like to think that if somebody paid one million dollars for something, then that thing is kind of worth something, which is arguable at most. Um, relating to these guys here, um, a lot of people have suggested that this isn't actually very valuable, and that the reason the, the art galleries have started selling these kind of artworks is because they want to be hype. They want to they want to show to everybody that they're interested in the new domain of AI and that they're, they're curious about what's happening. And more of this was more like a PR stunt rather than an actual um, artistic exploration of the medium. Um, and this is also one of the reasons why I mentioned that this is only a very small set of algorithms and that actual AI art is still years ahead. Like there's still a lot of work that needs to be done until we actually understand the values of these things. Like what does it mean for us to have um, like, sorry, I'm looking for a different image. I, like, what, what does it mean for us to feed an algorithm hundreds of images and to see its output? Does it have any meaning for us as humans or not? Like, this is still something that is in development, and this is why it's so interesting, you know? Like, it is, it is hard to understand what this is in general. Uh, okay, th did this answer your question or no? Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe we can talk about it later. Okay, anybody else has any questions? Okay. And seeing the algorithms that generate each uh, um, mm -hmm. piece of art, uh, could you personally uh, have a taste? Uh, do you mean if you can have a taste for these things? To, yes. Of to, course. To so personally, I love them. Like um, one, one compared to another one, for example, just uh, if you see the algorithm. Okay, so um, that is an interesting question, to be honest. Um, you mean j just look at the code and, and, and feel if the code has any aesthetic value? Okay, yeah. Personally, I would say that th this guy here has more aesthetic value than this guy here. Uh, and exactly because the code generates... Um, so here's how I would like to think about it. Because the code generates the distribution, depending on how interesting the distribution is, this is how interesting the code is to me. Because the code is the system. And, and I, uh, when you're doing generative art, you're, in, you're interested in the systems. And so this is how I would think about it. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> it's like basically, okay, here, give, let me give you a different reason. Um, imagine looking at the, the engine of a car. You're interested in the engine because you, um, you want to know, for, for example, when you're looking at the engine, you're interested in how fast does the engine work, how efficient it is, um, what kind of interesting properties does it have. And this is the same case here. Okay? Okay? Then... Actually, I have two questions about mm -hmm. uh, copyrights. Mm -hmm. One, because you need to feed them with uh, more better uh, mm -hmm. pictures. So, as I understand, you need to have copyrights for all of these pictures to... Because this is kind of tricky, because this is not Picasso, but if you will feed it with hundreds of Picasso, mm -hmm. should you, in theory, have copyrights for all of them? This is a wonderful question. So, this is the reason why I said AI, why neural nets are a nightmare in general. Because here's the problem. I can train, if you give me one million images, I can train a neural net that remembers all of these images perfectly. And then, um, let's say I have, let, let me give you a, a different example that is a bit more uh, perverse, maybe. Imagine you have 10,000 images of, of somebody's eye, of, of his retina. Um, this is considered private information. But the problem is, if I train a neural network on this image, on these images, I can also re-regenerate those images once these images are gone. So basically, there is no such thing as privacy when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence and data. And, and this is one of the problems that, that these things have with copyright. Basically, once you give them to an algorithm, it is impossible to take them back because they always stay in the neural network to some degree. Or you can always modify the architecture in such a way that that, that architecture will remember the images. And so this is like one of the problems.
Okay, it actually answers the second question. <laughs> okay. It was about people's uh, pictures. So yeah, th this is a real problem. Like, if you think about it, these guys, these guys look like somebody else. And then the question is, do those people have a right to privacy and a, and a right to their own image? Because this is actually something stipulated in, in copyright. I have an, a right for my personal image in the media. And this somehow violates that thing. Because now somebody can just generate one of these guys here, put him on a, um, on a commercial, and, and use that thing. And then it, 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 it becomes really problematic. So definitely. Okay? Okay then, so thank you for your attention. <laughs>